Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Get this thing working. The message that God has impressed my heart to bring to you this morning is based on Psalm 22. It's called the Psalm of Calvary. Amen. If you look at the life of David, who wrote this song, can you find any experience in his life that matches what he wrote here? Yeah. This song is a song of Christ. And he wrote this while he was led by the Holy Spirit to see what our Savior would suffer what he would go through to save us from our sins. And brothers and sisters, before I start, let us once again bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of being here. I thank you for the words that you've given me to speak, and I pray that they're not mine. That what is heard this morning will not be me, but Lord, it will be you. That as we gather here, we will lift Jesus Christ, and we will lift him on high. And that, Father, as we listen and as we read, our hearts will be touched for the great love that you have shown us by giving us your Son, Jesus Christ. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, open your Bibles to Psalm 22. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. Psalm 22 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, I find no rest. Again, let me share with you from this book, Christ in the Psalms. To be on page 27. It says, Psalm 22 is one of, if not, the best known of the Psalms about Jesus. Some students of Scripture have attempted to find a time and place where this Psalm might be identified with David's experiences, but to no avail. What is described in this Psalm, no one but Christ experienced. From beginning to end, it is Christ and Him crucified. Amen? Amen. You guys awake? Yeah. Yes. Okay. First Corinthians 2, verse 2. Are you familiar with this verse? Yes, yes. Is this a good principle to live by? Amen. When you're dealing with conflict within the church, or in your own families, is this a good principle to live by? Yes. Yes. Paul says, For I resolve to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and what? Him crucified. Him crucified. If you uplift Christ, you can never go wrong. Amen? Amen. And if you keep your focus on Christ, no matter what the devil throws at you, Christ inside of you is more powerful than anything the devil can do to you. Amen? Amen. Think about the birth of Jesus Christ. The God of heaven becoming flesh. Don't you think it would be more fitting if he was born in the palace? And yet, where was God's plan for him to be born at? But in a stable, lying in a manger. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Let's look at verses 6 and 7. This is a very familiar passage. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. For the 
the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish all of this. Do you realize that God the Father's greatest gift to mankind is Him giving us God, His Son? Amen? Amen. But think about how He gave Him to us. God, His Son, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Psalm of Calvary, turn again to Luke chapter 1, and let's look at verses 31 and 32. For you're familiar with the birth of Jesus, but you realize that after so many days, Mary and Joseph took him to the temple. And who did he meet in the temple? You guys remember? Two people, Simeon, and then there was a woman. But let's look at Simeon. Simeon had been waiting all his life to see the redemption of Israel. And when Mary walks in with this child, he knew through the power of the Holy Spirit who this child was. So he takes this child and it says, Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And then he looks at Mary and he says to her, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Did that take place? Yes. yes. Think about the faith of Mary. As a young, young girl, when Gabriel came to her, and she said, Lord, your will be done. But yet, did it cost her anything? You find out here that it cost her a lot. But she was always faithful. <clears throat> Jesus is called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. So Jesus is God with us. It tells us that this baby would grow into a man and have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him in full measure so that Jesus could say in John 5, 19, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do, the Son also does. Amen. And this Jesus did by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Did Jesus do anything outside of the power of the Holy Spirit? No. Did Jesus ever use his divinity to work any of the miracles that he worked? No. Did Jesus ever use his divinity to overcome sin? No. Very important uh, part right there. What Jesus did and what Jesus accomplished, He accomplished by the Holy Spirit. And this He did as an example for His followers throughout the ages to show us the power that is available to us who look to Him by faith to live as He lived and to love as He loved. Jesus, Emmanuel, was born to bring light and life to this dark and sin-filled world. He was to show this world that God is love. Amen? Amen? And that the Father's love has no limits and no boundaries. Amen? Amen? And that God was willing to give all of heaven as a free gift to save a creation that was in rebellion against Him. Jesus was born to be our suffering Savior. Let's look at Isaiah 53 verse 3-5 through again. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5. This is another very familiar text of what Jesus' life would be like. What I want you to do is I want us all to read this together from what's up here. So they're all reading the same thing. It says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom the people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. Amen. This, brothers and sisters, this is what Christmas 
is all about. Amen. This is why our Savior came. And this morning, I want you to understand the mind of Christ as He paid for your sins and mine. The Bible tells us, let this mind be in you. Amen. That was also Amen. in Christ Jesus. Amen. What went through Jesus' mind while He was on the cross? Amen. While He who knew no sin became sin. Can you read what that says up there? Have you thought about the true cost of sin? This is one of the problems with the church and the world today, those who profess Christ, is that we have become so accustomed to sin that we now no longer know the true cost of sin. This is why we are told from the spirit of prophecy that we should take an hour each day to do what? <coughs> To contemplate the life of Christ, especially the last scenes of his life. Right? Why should we concentrate on the last scenes of his life? It is because that shows us the true cost of sin. Brothers and sisters, when you leave here today, I hope you don't leave here the same. I hope you get a grasp and a glimpse of what Jesus endured for us. But I also want you to understand what the Father and the Holy Spirit endured for us. Amen. Jesus said, I and my Father are what? One. One. Whatever happened to Him, they all felt. We looked at Psalm 22, but turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 15, 34. Again, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We find the fulfillment of this in Mark 15, 34. Mark 15, 34 says, And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloa, Eloa, lama sabachthani, which means what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ on the cross, crying out these words, shows us the true cause of sin. But let me ask you, why did Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my, in the King James, roaring. That's a tough one for me to say. I'd like to share with you again from Christ and Psalms. This is a book from Gerald Finneman. He writes that the word roaring comes from a root word that means to howl in pain like a beast. Now I want you to understand this. During this time, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the sun should be shining brightly, correct? But did darkness come over the land? Yes. Do you understand why darkness came upon the land? There's two reasons. One, because the Father was shielding His Son so that the people were not able to look upon Him in the depths of His agony. But there's another reason as well, and we'll get into that. Christ in mental anguish screamed in pain, sounding more like the agonizing cry of a wild beast in pain than a human being. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought what Christ endured on this cross? The cacophonious screams of his voice echoed the state of his mind as he felt the breakup of his union with his heavenly Father. This was the only time from eternity that such a separation took place within the Godhead. That's right. As much as we can understand of it, let's consider Christ's mental anguish. But when we are through here, there will be much more to it than we can possibly understand. I want you to think of what Christ endured for us. Strong muscles became like liquid. For verse 14 says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, and it is melted within me. Strong muscles became like liquid through the torturous ordeal he went through. The physical coming apart at the joints was a faint reflection of his mental state as he felt the full force and load of sin of all of us that was laid upon him. His heart became like wax under the heat of fire. 
The heart in Hebrew thought means the intellect as well as the emotions. His mind was going through the process of a meltdown from the crushing pressure of grief, just as wax changes to a liquid state by the application of heat. The word melt means to be dissolved by fear or terror or by the wasting of disease. It is applied also to fainting that comes from fear, grief, or sorrow. As used here, it describes the disorientation of Christ's mind as he felt the guilt and the shame of our sins within his nervous system. Do you understand that when the Bible says, He who knew no sin, what? Amen. Do you fully grasp that? No. <laughs> this is something you should meditate on every day. Because this will open your eyes to who Jesus Christ is and the love that God has for each one of us. Amen. Do you understand that he who knew no sin became sin? And not just the sin of one, but the sin of all. Amen. But doesn't the word say that he took the sins of the world upon him? The pent-up fires of hell burst upon him at Calvary with all the fury of atomic energy. Sin was consuming Jesus Christ. This was equivalent to the experience of the lake of fire about which the Revelator writes in Revelation chapter 20. This experience was the previously anticipated hour that caused Jesus to tremble, recorded in John chapter 12 when the Gentiles came to see him in the temple court. He knew their coming was a fulfillment of prophecy, he knew that their coming to him would be one of the evidences that he was on target with his mission to redeem mankind. He cried out, God, save me from this hour. And there was a fierce struggle within, within him between his emotions and his determination to do God's will. Then he said in submission, but for this cause I came into this hour. Father, glorify me. How was Christ glorified? Do you understand and grasp that the cross is the glorification of Jesus Christ? Amen. What we observe in this psalm and others is the meltdown of the mind of Christ. It was like, it was melting like wax as he was made to be sin for us. Sin worked its defeating and disheartening effect upon his mind. Convulsions of agony racked his mind as well as his frame. Agony suggests mental or physical torment, so excruciating that body and or mind are convulsed from the force of it. The horrors of the curse were upon him. Feelings of guilt and condemnation tortured him. This is a horrible sight. Amen? Amen. But do you realize that this awfulness is our salvation? Amen. Although he knew no sin, he was made to be sin for us. He did not sin, but sin destroyed him. Our sin, my sin, my guilt, my condemnation were imputed to him. This was just as certain and real to him as when his righteousness is imputed to us. He was conscious of imputed sins to himself. He felt the weight of them. They devastated and demolished him. There were disturbances in his mind and in his feelings. But even though this meltdown, or but even through this meltdown, the faith of Jesus held. Amen? Amen. Let me rephrase that. Not rephrase it, let me read it again. All that he went through, all that he endured on the cross, do you understand that the faith of Jesus held? Amen? Amen. Amen. I bring that to you because, brothers and sisters, this is the same faith that you and I are called to have. This is the same faith that if we are alive, when Christ comes, is what's going to get us through that time of trouble. Amen? Amen. We are called to have the faith of Jesus. And you see this faith of Jesus while he endures the cross. While he who knew no sin became sin. But even through this meltdown, the faith of Jesus held. The beginning verse of Psalm 22 presents the faith of Jesus. For he says, my God, my God. Those words express the faith of Jesus. Then his feelings spoke. His feelings said, why have you forsaken me? <coughs>
If you allow me, I'd like to share with you from Desire of Ages. It says, but now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Can you fathom that? The separation that he endured on the cross because of sin was more painful to him than the actual physical pain that he endured from being nailed up there to the cross. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. For he feared sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup that he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So I asked you this question. While Jesus was feeling and experiencing this, could He have come down from that cross? Yeah. Yeah. Could He at any time ask His Father to send a legion of angels yeah. to take Him down? Yeah. What kept Him hanging there? That's right. You and me. Do you realize what this statement says is that he could not see through the darkness and the depth of sin. He felt it was so dark and so powerful that it would separate him from his father eternally. And he was willing to still die so that you and I could live. Right. Don't just overlook this. Don't go home unchanged. But allow this to penetrate your heart. Because if this won't penetrate your heart, brothers and sisters, nothing will. Amen? Amen. Reading on with amazement, angels witness the Savior's despairing agony. The hosts of heaven veiled their faces from the fearful sight. Think about this. Inanimate nature expressed sympathy with, it, with its insulted and dying author. For the sun refused to look upon the awful scene. Its full, bright rays were illuminating the earth at midday, when suddenly it seemed to be blotted out. Complete darkness, like a funeral pall, enveloped the cross. Scripture tells us that there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. There was no eclipse or other natural cause for this darkness, which was as deep as midnight without moon or stars. It was a miraculous testimony given by God that the faith of after generations might be confirmed. In that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. He makes darkness his pavilion and conceals his glory from human eyes. God and his holy angels were beside the cross. The Father was with his Son, yet his presence was not revealed. Think about this, brothers and sisters. Had God's glory flashed forth from the cloud, every human beholder would have been destroyed. Let that sink in. In that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the Father's presence. Do you understand what the Father went through at this time? He wanted to be as close to His Son as possible, but yet He could not comfort Him, for Christ had to tread this alone. The Father and the Holy Spirit had to go through this as well. Now think about this. Because at any point, the Father could have said, I've had enough. I want to be with my Son. And if He would have flashed through that darkness, it tells us that everyone who was there would have been destroyed. God had to hide His omnipotence. And watch all this happening. But also understand this. Who was it that was pouring out His wrath on Christ at that time? Think about these things. Think about the love that God has shown here for you and for me and what he was doing to his son because he thought you and I are worthy of this, of being saved. I'm worthy of what Christ went through. 
I'm not worthy of the love that God has shown. But thank God he sees me in a different way. And in that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the Father's presence. He trod the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with him. And you hear that awful cry coming from the Savior's lips that echoes down through the ages. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isaiah 9.18 says, For the wickedness burns as the fire. It shall devour the briars and thorns, and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke. I bring that text to you to bring this next text that says, Although he knew no sin, he became, or he was made sin for us. He did not sin, but sin destroyed him. Turn with me to Romans 6, verse 23. You familiar with what this verse says before you even look at it? Romans 6, 23, Paul writes, For the wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the wages of sin is death. What death is Paul speaking of here? Very good. Very good. God's invitation and promise. Listen, God always gives an invitation and a promise before giving a warning of punishment and final destruction. Revelation 21, 5 through 8 says, And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is what? This is the second death. Do you realize that's the death that Jesus Christ died so that you and I would never have to face that? Amen. 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 What has God done for us? 2 Corinthians 5.21 We've read this, we've looked at it. God had made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Brothers and sisters, I beseech you. Do you know what that word beseech means? Yes, I beg. I beg you this morning. Please, think about what God has done for us. Behold Jesus Christ. Behold the love that the Father has given unto us, that we can be called children of God. Behold and become transformed by the love of God that is given to us in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is your Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane. Again, Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom the people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. And brothers and sisters, by his wounds, we are healed. For we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. This is your Savior. This is my precious Savior. He who knew no sin became sin. Think about what that meant for Jesus. Sin caused a separation within the Godhead. On the cross, Jesus became sin, and the Father poured out His anger, full strength, on His own Son. Here we see God's justice dealing with the sinner. That should have been me. It should have been you. 
And we see God's supreme mercy and love that while we were without strength, lost in our sins, enemies of God, God is reconciling us to Himself by giving Jesus Christ my sin. And making Him the wretchedness. That is me. 